<laughs> um, so good afternoon or good morning for those of us who stayed out way too late last night. Um, I first want to thank my hosts. I want to thank Adam and Hakan and uh, all the Viking gentlemen who stayed out until 2 a.m. drinking and talking about philosophy of video games. Very exciting. So I'm going to talk this morning about um, uh, both policy work in America and about um, some of the research I did before that. After sort of talking to students and designers here, I realized that for many of you, um, I think this is a new crowd for me. So for many of you, I think the way that you probably might know my stuff is through um, being the so-called fun czar of the federal government. Um, I tried to get them to call me Tsarina, a duchess, all sorts of creative names, none of them stuck except for fun czar, so that was my title for a while. I worked in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as a senior policy analyst on video games, which is a major win in the States, in case you didn't know, that was like the delivery line. Right? Right there. But before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work I do on video games and learning. Um, Learning is an interesting topic to study, obviously. Um, and my original work, I was telling stories earlier about the first time I came to Sweden was when I was in the middle of doing a two and a half year ethnography. I did work on massively multiplayer online games, a genre that has really shifted now that World of Warcraft came out and kind of broke the market in certain ways and continues to not only dominate, but shift what we think about when we think about MMOs. Um, and a lot of my work before that uh, had really sort of followed trends in the state. So trying to think about my own research followed not what great games did, but what everyday people did. So I studied titles, um, like at the time, uh, the global title, Lineage 1, that was the global dominant on the market, then its sequel, Lineage 2. These are player versus player games played online. I assume everyone's kind of oh, familiar with that. It's nice to be in an audience where I don't have to explain MMO or PVP. Thank you. Um, that's not my typical, so normally I have to stop here and explain how player versus player does not make me a horrible person. Other things I do make me a horrible person, but playing against people doesn't. Um, I played, uh, I studied games like RuneScape, Kid Spaces, um, and World of Warcraft, of course. There's no way to study MMOs without studying World of Warcraft. Yay, though, people have called it the world's biggest massively single-player game in many ways. Um, so I spent a long time doing this ethnography, and for those of you who are doing dissertations, I want you to know that this is the moment in a talk or in a career when all of that work of a dissertation, a 250-page tome that I poured my life into is boiled down into one single slide. There's my slide. That's all the work right there. Those were my findings. Great, aren't they? And after that, with the help of foundations like the MacArthur Foundation, Spencer Foundation, and others, um, I really tried to follow up this large-scale ethnography where I was looking at, let me go back. So in this large-scale ethnography, I was looking at what is the intellectual culture of gameplay. You see, in 2002 and 2003 in the States, there was this idea that, not just an idea, it was an often touted claim that video game was torpid, video game playing was torpid, invited inert reception, was antisocial, etc. My own area of expertise is I'm an expert in cognition. I'm a, particularly in social interaction and cognition. So I was very interested in what's actually happening if kids and adults are spending this much time on games. What is the intellectual life and culture of those games? So it turns out, as I don't really have to prove to you, because many of you are here are because of it, but yes, it is actually a rich culture. Um, it's kind of hard to say that after the last year of Gamergate, I want you to know. It's kind of hard to say that the culture of gaming is in fact intellectual. Um, but we're going to go ahead and make that claim, and I can say later, especially over drinks, exactly why that's a problem. Um, but after that, we'd, uh, I decided I had a research lab going, and we were able to start asking some more empirical questions. And by that, I mean questions where we were doing um, not just looking at what were cultural practices in an ethnographic sense, but what were the distributions and norms of those practices. So we chose four or five main themes that we studied, scientific reasoning, uh, digital media literacy, which I'm very interested in, this notion I call pop cosmopolitanism, or the idea that online spaces are diverse in different ways than, on than offline spaces, especially for young people in America. Um, and we ran this after-school lab for boys for two years, 
I'll touch on it a little bit, but um, really trying to think about can games be a bit of a gateway drug into other intellectual practices? Because if what we're seeing online is rich, how do you use games as a way to actually intrigue or um, uh, to invite uh, kids in the States that are not actually normally in those communities? How do you get them in and how do you get them interested in, in uh, higher end practices? So I want to pull one of these studies out to give you an idea of what this work looks like. Um, so I'll, I'll focus on science. And this is some early work that we did uh, probably 2009, 2010. And to start, this, this idea of, of uh, scientific reasoning in game communities really came out of a lineage one and lineage two, the ethnography. One of my informants was a 17-year-old. His um, avatar name was Steel Dragon. He was one of my main informants. So every couple of weeks, we would get on the phone and talk, and we would talk about the game, et cetera. We played together. Um, and in the summertime, uh, he and a bunch of other players were camping boss monsters in lineage because the spawn points were always in the same places. They didn't randomize them out at all. So people would lay around and camp, right? You get bored camping, and next thing you know, you start debating topics in the game or topics in politics or whatever it may be. So uh, as part of this gameplay, he and a bunch of guys got in a debate about what would be the best um, arrangement of roles and equipment and weapons in order to take the boss monster down. So this argument continued. And next thing you know, they decide that they're going to start collecting data by trying every permutation of combination you could do. And then they started putting those data, the results, in Excel spreadsheets. And then they built little mathematical models of those relationships. And then they argued about which model was more predictive. Um, yeah. And if you're a science person interested in scientific reasoning, this is like porn to you, right? This is amazing. You're like, say that slowly, one more time. Do it. Okay? Um, so this was his description to me, and I asked for files, and I said, oh, tell me more, tell me more. And finally, I said, Steel Dragon, do you realize what you're doing is model-based reasoning in science? It's really, it's the essence of science, um, or at least uh, 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 contemporary science, uh, one type of it. There's two other forms as well, but model-based reasoning is this, like, absolute quintessential form of science, and you guys are doing it as part of your game. And he was like, God, Constance, no, we're just trying to cheat the game. So I found this very interesting, um, both in that the idea of it being science re repulsed him in many ways, but also the fact that this was happening in a play space when it is so difficult to have happen in a classroom or a formal space. And I know because I study those spaces as well. So after doing this ethnography, I wanted to understand, is Steel Dragon an outlier? Is he just this precocious, smart kid who happens to theory craft around the game? Or is this kind of activity more general? Um, and what is the nature and quality of that activity? So we did a study. We, uh, by this time, World of Warcraft has entered the market. This is post-2004. In fact, this was after the second patch, Burning Crusade, for those of you who were around during those days. Um, and we decided that we would pull a random uh, selection of forum data and just look at the data to figure out um, how much of it was social banter, how much of it was focused on problem solving, how much of it was model-based reasoning of the sorts that I was very interested in, that Steel Dragon and his, his friends were doing, um, how much of it was good argumentation, how much of it was bad argumentation. So we did this study. Um, now, this sort of sample size gives us a confidence interval around 9%, not too bad. And here's what we got. So I'll walk you through it. So the first question we had, we wanted to ask, was about scientific discursive practices. So the basic question here was, are people using arguments? Are they backing their claims with data? Are they able to argue against those data or reinterpret them for a new theory? Um, the second one, and obviously, you know, you see that saturation of codes are not so bad. The second thing that we looked at was model-based reasoning, just of the sort I just described. Are they looking at systems and building models, including um, understanding the relationship between variables uh, within a system, and doing possibly mathematical modeling computation? And the third one was really about epistemology, because I wanted to make sure that, um, that talk that looked like science 
but that was coming from the perspective of there being one big T truth, one answer. Um, and usually when people talk about big T truth, it is usually their big T truth that they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that we didn't mistake that for scientific because absolutist frameworks like that don't work very well in science. Science is a, is a domain in which you theory craft, yes you do, and then as new data comes along, your theory has to change to actually address those new data or new theory comes along to replace yours. Finally, we looked at mathematics, of course, um, because I have a background in mathematics, so it's a favorite topic. So <clears throat> overall, interesting profile, not that interesting though. Let me walk you through what these numbers mean. Notice that mathematical modeling is about 4%, pretty small number, so uh, I'll get there in a minute. So first the question was, as far as scientific discursive practices, is this talk productive, right? It's a forum about a game about ogres and elves, right? At this time, Baron chat was like the number one thing, right? Chuck Norris jokes. Is the talk there productive at all? On a good day, I would have guessed probably maybe a third of it. On an optimistic day where I was like, gaming is amazing, pre-Gamergate. Gaming is amazing. It's going to be a third of it's going to be problem solving. And instead, what we found was that 86% of it was problem solving. Could actually, from a cognitive point of view, be seen as social knowledge construction. Only 8% was banter. Now, throughout this study, I should warn you, when something was not codable or interpretable, we didn't force the interpretation. We simply set it aside and said we can't tell. So 6% is uncodable. And every single one of these analyses, you'll see like a, a bucket of not sure. All right. <clears throat> so um, when it came to social knowledge construction, what this looked like was someone would post a question or a topic or a claim. You would have claims with evidence and counterclaims with evidence. And then usually at the end of those threaded discussions, one of two things happened. Either it petered out and the last answer was sort of treated as though that were the actual final best answer. Or the last post would do some version of sort of summarizing, right? Now, scientific discursive practices as well. Oh, sorry. Um, what you see here is interesting and in that, yeah, OK, so about 37% of the time they're agreeing and elaborating each other's theories. The other 37% of the time they're disagreeing. Eh, OK, interesting, but not really. What's interesting here is the use of data or evidence is almost 30%, much higher than what you see in typical argumentation conversations. Um, for model-based reasoning of the sort that I talked about with Steel Dragon, so 58% of the discussion, over half of it, was focused on systems, right? Understanding feedback at 41%. Model-based reasoning was at 11%, so smaller proportion. But when you think about the kinds of behaviors I described from the ethnography, it certainly is not a one-off. It's a one in 10. And then finally, as far as actually mathematizing their models, um, you found that 4% were using mathematical models and 1% were actually using mathematical computation as a form of argument and proof, which is really exciting because it's not often that math gets leveraged in conversations as mathematical computation in everyday talk uh, and play spaces as a way to make and win an argument. Those numbers are small, but when they happen, they're fairly salient. So let me show you an example, uh, the, the mathematical number. But let me show you what a post looks like. So here's a typical post of something that we analyzed. He starts off saying, you know, the unfortunate fact is that there is no shadow nuke, blah, 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 blah. All right, so first, he's actually building on this hypothetical skill, there is no shadow nuke. Um, it's a theoretical sort of proposition, like an A-bomb in the game, like what would the A-bomb be, et cetera. So he's building on someone else's ideas, social knowledge construction. Later on goes to say, I've put, my, I put together my own spreadsheet, which goes into more detail and takes into account exactly what happens to spells with regard to talents. So when I say model-based reasoning, I mean just this kind of thinking. Um, he references outside resources, which is, are important. You wouldn't want everyone remaking the wheel again and again and again. You really can't call it knowledge building if no one is actually building on what we know. So here he says, if I got anything wrong, feel free to email me. But if you read up at WoW Wiki and check out the coefficients used in Theorycraft mod, you'll find I'm, I'm consistent with respect to them. And then down later he says, now if Flay were empowered to the point that it received 65% plus damage, then Shadow would be up around 45% damage. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so when we say model testing or prediction, what's happening here is he's saying, if you were to change this one variable, here would be the outcome. 
So when I talk about model and prediction, that's the kind of behavior I'm talking about. Make sense? Look familiar? It's not unusual on game forums, right? So what does that model look like? That 1% or actually 4% of mathematical model it looks something like that. So when it happens, it may only happen 4% of the time, but when it happens, it's fairly glorious. Glorious. All right, finally, tacit epistemology, sort of looking at to what extent, how do they position their claims to knowledge? You see, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna try to do sort of scientific reasoning on a, on a game engine, you know, and a game engine actually has an algorithm that makes it go, so, um, the idea of reverse engineering, you can end up with a sort of uh, argument that is less about sort of contemporary model-based reasoning and science and more about reverse engineering the code, right? So we wanted to make sure we didn't actually uh, overcount that. Um, and what, ooh, let me go back. Uh, and what you find is that, so the absolutist is 30%. That's the kind of talk that something like, uh, let's see if I can get us there. I'll come back. No, no. Let's see. There. Whose mom believes that blah, right? That's absolutist talk. As though there's one big T truth and they have it. Relativist. Experts disagree. It's all just opinion. So why are we arguing in the first place? Hmm? And finally, evaluative. I see your point, but I wonder if. You actually have to have an evaluative perspective on knowledge in the first place for science to even matter, right? Think about it. If God or authority knows everything, then why would we be sitting around on a forum trying to debate it out? And if everything's relative, then what would be the point either way, right? So you need a kind of evaluative perspective for science to even be valued. Now, these numbers, okay, they're fine. I mean, they're actually, um, you know, interesting in themselves. But when you compare them in the states with studies of American reasoning, here's the comparison points, right? So in America, you find that 50% of Americans are totally absolutist. God or someone knows the answer, yes. 35% um, are relativists, nihilists, who say, in fact, there's no way to ever know the answer and we're all wasting our time. Let's go out for another drink. Right. Um, only 15% of Americans would take an evaluative perspective in the first place meaning that figuring out an answer is what we do jointly through de deliberation and argument. So when you compare sort of the game community and a representative sample to typical American discourse, not so shabby. Well, until this last year, and then that's a different issue. Someone asked me, do you know I'm baiting you to ask me a question about this so I can rant? Okay. Um, so how does that compare to American schools? Well, in America, only one in five Americans is considered scientifically literate. By that, I mean can read at the eighth grade level the New York Times Tuesday edition on science and understand it, even though we have mandatory science in schools. And in fact, what you find is that the science instruction we use in classrooms is not just that good, not just not good for science, can actually end up engendering beliefs about science and epistemologies that are absolutely antithetical to science. So here's how this happens. You have a chemistry teacher. They have the chemistry book and you read in the chemistry book, but then you have these chemistry labs, right? Do you guys do this, right? Hands-on labs where you're blowing stuff up in the chem lab? Okay, thank you. All right, so in America, I'm probably sure it's the same here. Most chemistry teachers, for example, see those lab activities as where they're really getting to do science with kids. But the way that it's interpreted for students is something like this. They go into a lab experiment with their partner, the teacher has an answer, they do the experiment and redo the experiment until they get the answer that the teacher has. Folks, that's not science, that's actually orthogonal to science. In science, you don't redo your study until you get the answer you came in thinking you would have, right? There's no teacher that tells you the answer. So what you end up with is a form of activity in classrooms that actually at times can generate beliefs and epistemological uh, commitments that actually are very much thwarting science itself. So in America, while we firewall out games and talk about games and violence and misogyny and how games are rotting the American youth, um, inside what's happening in classrooms by comparison, schools look kind of, oh, tragic. Um, all right, so that gives you a sense of kind of the work that I had been doing in looking at 
um, sort of commercial games and what is the intellectual and cognitive side of those, of those uh, titles. So I did a lot of work looking at things like um, literacy, uh, sociocultural attitudes, and what have you. Um, but oh, one more note on collective problem solving. Sorry, I, I should mention this too. So in the last study, I don't know if any of you were thinking this, there's this idea that, uh, or there's a plausible hypothesis that it could have just been a smart handful of people in an ivory tower sort of doing wonderful work on the forum while everyone else sat back and watched it, right? Anyone have this thought? You should, it's a plausible idea, right? But it turns out that um, when you look at forum discussions, what we found was that that actually is not the case. The harder the problem, the longer the discussion, the more people it took to solve it. So you end up with a rating of not, not a few heavy posters and everyone else listening or lurking. What you saw was that as the conversation continued, more and more people chimed in. So you have this model not of, col not of collaborative problem solving, but collective. And lest we think that that's all just fun and games, um, if you look at things like the Obama campaign and some of the tools used in order to, uh, to collect data, aggregate data, and marshal across massive groups, some of those tools being used by the game community that our game community authored look remarkably like things like campaign tools, which our previous speaker, oh, I'm thinking about her work now. Um, okay, so back to topic. Um, so White House. So around 2011, I was tapped to join the White House staff to be an advisor on games. Um, now, in Sweden, that might seem Reasonable, normal, fine. In America, that's really unusual. And when I got the call to do it, I actually thought it was a crank call. I was like, really? Really, you're the White House? So um, I had just had my second kid. He was less than a year old, still nursing. And um, I get this call, and I'm thinking it's Office of Science and Technology Policy, and I'm thinking it's probably some boring bureaucratic office. I mean, I'm like an untenured faculty trying to study commercial video games, right? Life is hard but fun. Um, and I get this call and, and I figure, well, it's got to be like some sort of weird, you know, office stuck over in an agency, who knows what. But I'm going to go because usually it's good practice that when you get an offer like that, your job is to make them wish you said yes, even if you say no, right? So I go thinking, well, I'm going to say no because I have tenure and I have, a, you know, a three-year-old and a baby that's not, that, a baby's still nursing and I don't even know what this stupid office is, but I'm going to go and I get on a plane and I get in a cab and I give the address and, you know, and the cab takes me there and I get out of the cab and I'm like, what the hell? I'm at the White House, right? <laughs> no, really, I'm like, wow, what am I doing here? No idea. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so I'd plan on saying no, and it turns out that it's very difficult to say no to the President of the United States. So there was a yes. Um, let's see if I can go back this way. Okay, um, there he is. I know, isn't that great? Do you see the favorite part of this picture? Oh, I know. <laughs> now you've got to remember, this is first term Obama, so this is after eight years of Bush, right? We are all weeping with joy, right? <laughs> America can believe in science again. We can believe in technology again. Woo, right? Um, yeah, so that's my favorite shot of him. Uh, my boss was actually this gray-haired man on his right. His name is John Holdren. He's one of the world's top environmental scientists. John Holdren was put as the head of, um, of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And this is an office um, that every day at 7.30 in the morning, um, the president meets with a group of advisors on, you know, domestic affairs, foreign affairs, you know, whatever. Um, and one of them is science and technology, and he's that guy. So that's the guy I worked with. Um, now, why would games, what were they thinking <laughs> when they thought about games? Well, if you look at things like the administration's um, innovation strategy, it turns out that there's an argument for the role of games um, pretty much almost at every level. So whether you're thinking about games to address grand challenges, things like how do we reduce energy consumption in the states by 10% in five years? Well, one way you could do that is to take our smart grid system and to use behavioral economics and basic gamification to change the way people get information on their energy consumption and sort of get them to nudge their behaviors toward more um, 
um, toward uh, uh, conserving energy better, right? And you do that through things like comparing their meter readings with their neighbor's meter readings, right? I mean, you want to get like a neighborhood to reduce their energy consumption? Compare them to their rival neighborhood. And next thing you know, they're like, I am totally nailing this, right? It's true. So <clears throat> those are sort of grand challenges, sort of big things like how do you reduce our insane amount of eating up energy, but also like more sort of foundational work, like how do you train the next generation to deal with technology and tools? How do you make them knowledge brokers, knowledge constructors of the sort that I was studying online? Because actually game community, it's, I would still argue, I'm still optimistic enough to say that gamers and game communities very much are those, are those sort of, you know, highly literate, highly digitally literate and highly um, skilled, uh, Youth in the States and adults. All right, so why games? Well, from a government perspective, from a federal government and a state's perspective, there's four affordances mostly that you talk about. So the first one is just sheer population reach, right? If you think about the number of Americans who play, there are on average two consoles in every home. Um, between 12 to 17 year olds, 97% of American youth play. Girls play, girls have always played. Just getting that out there. 99% uh, of boys play, 94% of girls, and that gap is closing. Girls play, we always have. Getting that out there. We may like different titles, um, but we certainly are still playing and we're a huge consumer base. Okay. Um, number two, games are simulations. So when I talk to scientists out in agencies and I show them what contemporary games look like, they swoon. Right? This is science porn to them. They're like, that's a game. I can show you my, you know, I can show you my simulations and can we make that a game? Three, there's incredible data exhaust kicked off of games. So there's a whole new form of social science that's happening on computational social science. If you are not paying attention to this, you should. Um, because it raises a lot of the same issues that large data sets should raise, like privatization, privacy, and digital divides. No one talks about these things much, but uh, the data exhaust coming off of games is a uh, powerful data sets to look at not just human reasoning, but behaviors as well. Um, they also can be used for things like A-B testing and continuous improvement of products. Difficult to do that if it's not a digital title. Um, and they are used toward personalization. So even thinking about how can you change the workflow or, um, or educational sequence of tasks to better suit individual differences, right? Not a bad thing. Finally, they are what I would call an architecture for engagement. Um, and this is the part that, you know, I had the privilege of judging all of these amazing games. I was a third year person, a uh, third year judge. Um, and, you know, it, it blows my mind the amount of design talent that's just sitting outside this room. And you look at these games that people, you pick them up to play and you don't want to stop playing. Right? No one talks about addiction to books. They talk about addiction to games. And there's a reason for that. It's because games are a really sticky medium because they're designed to be sticky mediums. So game designers, I find, know a lot more about a user experience two minutes in, 20 minutes in, two hours in. That's not the way that many designers in, say, education or energy grid systems or basic science simulations think about their end users. Actually, they don't really think of them at all. Um, but here's in case I'm not convincing you through rhetoric, so a little bit of data. We did studies looking at things like reading, game-based reading versus school-based reading, and what you start to find out is that if you compare, let's see if I can get through this. Um, so if you take reading under the condition of interest, where people get to choose what they read, in this case it's the after-school club, so it's uh, 25 boys. Half of them are reading at least two grades below level. In the United States, that's normal. In the United States, boys read on average two grades below their level. That ought to puzzle us. Um, but if you look at their reading when you put them in the context of games and you ask them a question like, what problem are you trying to solve now and what would you like to read on it? And then you look at their reading again, what you find is that they will, uh, you can find um, that so-called struggling readers will read up to eight grades above their head, and differences between struggling and non-struggling readers absolutely disappear. And if you, uh, you know, one explanation could be, well, maybe it's 
prior knowledge. If you have a bunch of kids who are playing WOW and you have them read a text on WOW, they know more about WOW, so it's easier to read, right? Um, we looked for that relationship to see if prior knowledge would explain it because we actually measured that and it didn't at all. What actually explained it was that when you open the transcripts of kids reading from their school book versus from the game environment where they were actually interested in the text, there's this one stat that really jumps out and it's something called a self-correction rate. Now I'm going to nerd for a minute, so here goes because I love literacy. Um, so in reading, so every reader... Um, Every reader that's actually reading anything of substance, really, or that's new information for them, is going to encounter challenges in the text, right? So you hit a word that you don't know, but you can use context um, and other cues to figure out what the meaning is and you move on. That's called a self-correction. So good reading isn't that it's never challenging. Good reading is that when you run into a challenge, you can actually figure it out on your own. You can bootstrap your own understanding. So when we looked at kids reading under the conditions of school text, right, what you found was that they had the same error rate, but the self-correction rate was about uh, 16, 17%. When you put them in the condition where they actually care about what they're reading when they're engaged, that self-correction rate more than doubles. And it actually takes care of any of the, of the differences in reading scores that you see. So... Um, all of that's to say that the idea that a text or a medium is engaging is non-trivial. Engagement is also sort of the part and parcel of performance in a really weird way. Um, so engagement matters. So the fact that games are these architectures for engagement makes a big difference. Now, what did I do in the White House? Um, so I had three main questions in my portfolio. In the White House, you talk about portfolios of work. I learned that. Um, Number one was what games should exist that don't yet. Number two was how do we create this ecosystem that might generate those games? How do you create, you know, rather than just sort of dictating what ought to be made, like how do you create an environment where those kinds of games would be made on an open market? And three, what kind of scientific discoveries could we make through video games? Um, and I put this in here for you, Adam. You know that, right? Okay. So I did. I put this in for you. Um, so that's the portal gun. And a colleague and I actually snuck it into the White House and stuck it on the shelf in one of the, um, one of the conference rooms. So in the conference room, keep an eye on CNN and you'll see it every once in a while. It's like parts of the Mars rover thing and more NASA space stuff and a big award and portal gun. <laughs> totally true. No one has noticed. This is the second time I've talked about it publicly. I will probably get busted at some point. But I'm in Sweden, so what can they do, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's still there on a shelf, just sitting. Thank you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Because if you're not going to actually prank the White House while you're there, really, <laughs> what are you doing? We didn't. Um, okay. So this innovation ecosystem in the States, I really worked with four different, um, four different entities or stakeholders in this space. And I'm really only going to talk about two. So one, of my, one, one part of my job was to sort of look at all of the investments going into games across federal agencies and try to figure out how to improve their knowledge sharing and improve the stuff that they're investing in, all right? Because you have a bunch of people who um, are really smart in, say, cancer research, and they believe that a platform like a kind of folded platform or a platform for crowdsourcing the problem could be really vital, but they have no idea what game design looks like. So part of my job was to work with these agencies to sort of figure out how do I help you connect with people who do know how to make those kinds of games, who can help you make better decisions. So um, when I first when I first got to DC, you know, I thought, well, I got a fur, I don't know how to do this job. I, I still don't know what senior policy analyst means, um, though I can tell you I know uh, what the substance of the work was, but for policy analysis, my first thought was, okay, well, let me go walk around to the agencies and literally I want to see the games that you're funding. I just need to go see them. I'm a person that I need to play it myself. Like, show me what you're, what you're doing, what you're funding. So I did this for about four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and I realized there were so many different sort of pockets of people that were using games as the medium for various um, uh, national efforts, right, uh, that... I needed to pull them all together. So the first time we held a meeting was in November 2011. 
Um, we had 70 people who came to the White House. We met in this conference room. And we had 23 agency offices represented. So by the time um, that group now is 206 program officers across 33 agencies and four White House offices. So that is 206 experts in the federal government who explicitly fund games. It's kind of cool. Now, if you look at the breakdown, what you see is that, you know, of course, the big top three is still Department of Defense. The biggest investor in games from the federal government has always been the military, right? Um, and it continues to be the military. Whole another conversation there. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services is second. Education is third. I tend to work in the education sector myself. And then, you know, arts endowment is much lower, but that's also because the amount of... So, one reason for this breakdown is because uh, the federal government budget, this represents the breakdown of the federal government budget. In other words, we put a ton of money into DOD. So it's not just that DOD does more investment in games, DOD just has a lot more money and does a lot more investment in whatever, okay? So this also represents sort of federal budget stuff. So I like to point out art endowment down there because I happen to think that's a really, really valuable place to have games and they're so tiny. Someone give them money in the States. Any politicians listening to me, put some money into the arts. All right. Um, the second thing that, another stakeholder we worked on was sort of academic. So we, we put together, you know, there are these uh, games, develop, like sort of game design and game research programs that are popping up, um, especially games for impact research at the time. So we started convening that group as well through the White House. And that group has now actually evolved into a much bigger program, which is this Higher Education Video Game Alliance, of which this program is a member. Right on. Yeah, right on. Do you notice anything missing in this map? Like anything outside of America? <laughs> we need to fix that, so let's fix it. Um, but this gives you a sense of sort of game design programs versus games industry companies in the States. I'll be happy when that's a global map and not a country map. There we are, Higher Education Video Game Alliance. Um, the whole mission of this particular group is really to underscore the cultural, scientific, and economic value of games. I'll say that one more time. The cultural importance, the scientific importance, and the economic importance. But I like the cultural part first myself. Um, we just did our first survey and analysis of institutions that do game programs. Um, and these data are actually um, pretty great to have after the year we've had uh, as a woman in games. Um, so if you look at freshman to sophomore retention, game programs do very well. In the States, for example, public institutions are, um, the, the retention rate is about 64%. Private schools, it's about 69%. For game programs, it's 88%. That's to say that when we attract students, we also keep them in the program. Yay! Um, it also turns out that our numbers on women are really good compared to other STEM fields. So, if you look at our adjacency fields in the states like computer science, computer engineering, etc., what you find is that video game programs attract twice as many women. Now, in the States, we have a significant problem going on with code and computer science. Not only do we not have very many women going into those fields, the number of women is declining steadily. It's getting worse, not better. So game programs are actually doubling those numbers. So it'll be interesting to find out why are we able to do that and how do we do more of it more broadly. I have some ideas, but I don't have data to back it up, just opinions. But not too bad, right? If you start looking at our game programs compared to computer science more broadly, we're not so bad. Um, I myself, since doing DC work, I resigned. And then it um, turns out you really don't get to resign for the White House, right? You kind of resign, but then they still call you up and say, so, we've got this thing. And you still have to say yes. And you go and you fly and you do that. Um, <clears throat> so I still work with the White House quite a bit. But I now get to be back with my family, which is great. Um, and my husband and I co-direct a center called the Games Learning and Society Center. Um, thank you, I have to add this stat because we're considered the number one school for games and learning in the States. Yay! Um, our mission is to create educational games that do not suck. Yeah, right, it's bold. I'm right up in there. Games that don't suck, right? Because most educational titles still suck in. 
So that's our mission. It's a bold statement. I hope by the time I retire, we will have fewer educational games that suck. Um, why do they suck? Well, because this is often the frame that we think of it. Now, I want you to look closely. What are they watching on television? See, this is an image in the 1960-61-62, the Ford Foundation, this massive philanthropy in the States, put all of this, television was just really hot, right? This is right when you had like, you know, Minnow, the head of our FCC, calling it a vast wasteland. TV was out. People were all a muck about it. They talked about it as though it were the, you know, the, the evil that was going to spawn all these ills among children like violence and misogyny. Does this sound familiar? Um, or you had rhetoric that said it was going to save humanity. Does that sound familiar? Um, so the Ford Foundation had this idea that they would create this vast so-called educational TV network. Um, and they poured money into that baby. And here's what it looked like. You ready? Look at what's on television. Look, everybody. We have a teacher with kids and desks. Watching a teacher with kids and desks. Amazing, right? Anyone see that? That's amazing. So you have a bunch of people who intend, they have very great intentions, and they want to sort of invest in this medium, but they basically turn the medium into nothing but more of the same, right? That's sort of where educational games are now, and that's certainly one frame that I would say is wrong. It's the wrong frame. Here's the other wrong frame. In my field, we, we use these words. I'm not even going to say them aloud because they're so ridiculous, and I'm so tired of hearing. This is the wrong frame, all right? Games aren't chocolate. Intellectual ideas are not broccoli. Games don't get poured onto broccoli. It doesn't happen, and that's gross. Um, so we partner with a lot of people that, we give, that give us money, thank God. We work in this Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. So um, I'm picking pictures here that would remind you of your fair Sweden, because all of the Swedes and Norwegians that immigrated to the States moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and then up to Minnesota, I'm telling you, you need to come, you will love it there, so come. Um, so we work in this magnificent center on campus called the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. Um, next door to what we call it the Purple Giant is our design team. So our researchers sit in this building, and see this little blob right there? That's our uh, Skunk Works design team. It turned out we had to move our design team off campus and out of the building because they were doing things like having Nerf gun wars and it really upset people on campus. They were like, we don't, this is not okay, right? Um, so we work in these two different buildings, but um, part of the work that we do, so here's sort of our breakdown. We have 17 full-time game designers, a bunch of doc students, but because we make educational games, we also work with a lot of teachers and we don't treat teachers like they're idiots. We actually treat them like they're co-designers. Um, and that's a huge commitment for us. And then we work with about 4,000 kids a year in just our sort of research wing, testing, retesting, user testing, and, and impact testing, assessing the games we say are, that they're doing what we say they're going to do. Um, here's our model. So, you know, we have those two buildings. We have, our model is that content experts and designers actually find the game in the content, right? Find the game in the content, not lather a game on top of the broccoli like chocolate but it's about trying to figure out where's the game in a particular body of work. On top of that, we add analytic systems, data architectures for looking at telemetry data and looking at, you know, sort of progressions through games and marrying them to what they learned, blah, 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 and we recycle. So here's an example. Uh, Dr. Jamie Thompson is one of the world's top scientists in stem cells. Um, so he works over in that beautiful, magnificent uh, Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. We basically turned it into a zombie game because if you're going to do stem cells, the first thing you should do is think about the zombie apocalypse. Yes, you should. Um, so that's the game we made. We made a whole bunch of other titles as well. Um, most of the time, as I've said, I... I am uh, I'm an expert on social interaction and cognition. I play games avidly, and I have lots of opinions about games, but I'm not a designer. I feel like that's confessional here. I'm not a designer. <laughs> I work next to them. It's great. I'm not a, really a designer. I do have one little project that, um, you know, there's a variety of projects I do, but there is one design project I, I work on. Um, but again, I'm not the main designer. And it came out of this meeting we held at the White House, another major um, accomplishment, I felt. 
We had a huge summit at the White House on um, games, neuroscience, and attention and well-being. So thinking about issues like happiness and the brain and games. Um, we published a bunch of articles out of it, sort of a call to arms. See, the one thing the White House does really well, there are two things. Number one, they know how to have some meetings. They love their meetings. And number two, they know how to like sort of elevate a particular conversation. So in the White House, you can do things like hold a meeting and say, there is now hereby going to be a world of work on X. And in this case, my X was games, the brain, and happiness. Um, so as part of our own work, now that I left the White House, I'm doing some projects around building tools for contemplative practices, for self-regulation of attention, um, building other tools that are for, this is from Crystals of Kador, which is a game about kindness. So you play a little robot guy in this world, and you encounter these dudes, the little broccoli fellas. Um, and the, the, the whole game is premised on the idea that you have no language in the game. You have to interact with them by understanding the expressions that they're giving you and responding productively back. So um, here's what they look like in action. So sad. I know. Um, what's so interesting about this is that when we build an animation like this, we don't just make the animation. We actually have in Ekman, the world experts on, on expression, on um, expressions that are cross-cultural and the 36 points in a face that actually humans use to detect emotion. And we had him in on this model, so notes here. These are all notes of back and forth where literally in our lab, it's the coolest thing ever when it happens. You get a world-renowned scientist on a topic that they are the, the expert in, sitting cheek to jowl with your designers, right? And then they make the most amazing products. See, from my end, I'm a researcher, so the idea of research actually having impact in actual product and development is really um, a beautiful thing. Um, so that's the kind of work that we're doing. Um, there he is, so sad. Uh, we do work like, uh, <laughs> we do things like cross-condition comparisons with, you know, commercial game titles that I love, doing fMRIs before and after to look at neural change, both in structure and function. We give traditional psychology, behavioral tasks. We look at telemetry data. We are analyzing these data now, and I'm not allowed to tell you the results, even though I have them. There will come a day, but not now. We also did to do fun things like having Matthew Ricard and other famous Buddhist monks game play, game test your games. It's totally awesome. You're like, so, so Richie Davidson, this gentleman, is um, uh, the founder of Affective Neuroscience. He's also a close collaborator with the Dalai Lama, um, working on, um, on contemplative practices in the brain. It turns out that meditation actually does significant work on your neural pathways. Um, he brings in these wonderful people like Matthew Ricard, who's known as the happiest man ever studied. Uh, it's true. Um, he's actually a, he's a scientist from France that, that left and became a Buddhist monk. Um, so we get to do things like have him play our games, which is absolutely hilarious. I'm like, so could I just get pictures of you as a Buddhist monk playing our game? <clears throat> That's me, shoulder surfing. Um, but I want to sort of sum up by saying, you know, um, the whole idea of this, of this effort is to say, you know, it's going back to sort of Montessori ideas that, in fact, education is a natural process carried out by a child, and it's not acquired by listening or by television being talked at by teachers or books or inert things. It's actually acquired through experiences. Now, if you look at something like video games, no matter which way you cut it, games are what take screen time and make it into activity time. It is an incredibly powerful thing to be able to give someone not a, a vicarious experience of watching a television show, but to give them a first-hand experience of something. That's a powerful form of learning in and of itself. So my final thing will be a call to arms. We have so much design talent here. I would charge all of you to consider just one time, just one game that might actually be toward children or a concept that you think is worth public understanding. It'll be worth your time, I promise. Besides, I need more help in making educational games that just don't suck. Um, I'm going to end there. I went over and I apologize. But if you like this stuff, we have a conference every year in the summer. 
Remember, this is where all the Swedes and Norwegians come when they immigrate to America. You will feel wonderfully at home. Uh, it's about 750 people, and we have it in Madison, Wisconsin. It's called the GLS Conference. And thank you. I have time for questions. Were you flashing me? And I ignored you. OK. I think I ignored his signs like, you're over, you're done. So questions, thank you. <laughs> oh, I thought you'd never ask. Shucks, Gamergate, what should I say about it? Um, yeah, it's been a really rough year. I mean, okay, so just all the women in this audience, could you just please stand up so I don't feel like I'm by myself? Check this out, man. That is awesome. Thank you. Go you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's been a rough year in the industry. Um, but it wasn't as though there weren't some issues about the depictions of women and the treatment of women in industry for a long time. Um, I think that there's um, a lot of puzzlement and trying to figure out what to do next. But I personally sort of, um, I'm in the mood to fight. So, you know, I'm like in that, I'm gonna Vaseline my face and take my earrings off and I'm ready to go and here's why. Because the people who are doing the Gamergate talk have been treated like the, from the industry by marketing in the industry as though they are the majority gamer since I got in this stuff in early 2000s. That has always been the case, but it has never been the case that they actually were. So you have games built for this audience and built for a certain rhetoric that never represented the actual diversity of players. So I feel like Gamergate in many ways is sort of the death rattle of a dying kind of minority that's upset because now no one's willing to treat them like they're the only player in town. And that upsets them. And as far as I'm concerned, well then get upset because I'm not gonna stop playing, I'm not gonna stop trying to make games. And oftentimes the very thing that keeps games open free and allows them to play the kind of games that they wanna play are people like me who have to walk into federal agencies or walk in with families from Sandy Hook and other tragedies and defend games as a medium of expression. I don't try to take away anyone else's games. I mean, in fact, I play titles that would probably be viewed as, you know, kind of inappropriate and overly persnickety and not very nice. I happen to like that kind of play. Um, but I definitely will not back down on the game issue. So that's how I feel about it. Um, so for any gamer games out there, if you have a problem with that, you can come see me later, talk about it. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, um. On that note, though, it's really interesting that um, the last four to six months in the States, <laughs> you know, it's uh, for anyone who actually thought that this kind of rabble rousing was going to get them somewhere, all it has done is like um, solidified the base. So in the States right now, if you were at GDC, all over the place, there were more women at GDC than I've ever seen in, in my life, and I've gone since 2004. There is more discussion right now of how you better not abuse women in our industry. There's more uh, organizations from grassroots all the way to top leadership who now have to deal with this issue. And this issue's been around for a long time. This just pushed the conversation over. So in a way, I sort of feel like, well, at least we're, at least we're there now, right? Um, so I'm not really happy about the doxing and bad behaviors toward colleagues of mine. Other questions? Thank you for asking about Gamergate. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I think after this talk, uh, you just became my new idol. So I, I really like your talk. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, did you feel that in the White House there was just a, there a lot of uh, prejudice against games? What they think that games are, they, they think they know what games are and that they're not interested in them. And do you think that uh, there will be a major, major change or that it has been a major change towards more seriously thinking about games? Yeah. Um, I've always thought that Sweden was far more ahead of the conversation than the States have been. So in the States, Games are still sort of associated as children's toys. 
But I think that a lot of that has shifted in the last couple years, um, and it has no credit of my work or anybody else's really. I think what happened was that as mobile platforms opened up and games just poured out, there's like a sea of games that are for mobile apps. What you had was um, a diversification and even further sort of mainstreaming of games. So now, you know, like your grandmother's playing, right? Your mother's playing, all these people are playing, your grandfather's playing. So I think part of what has tempered much of that naivety about games as a child's toy is the fact that there really is no such thing as gamers and non-gamers anymore. Um, not even generationally that's breaking down. So it's really hard to trivialize games as being terribly ill or, um, or nothing but a child's toy when everyone has a couple of them on their own smartphone, right? Um, so I think that that has been the biggest cultural shift. But I will say that every time in America, again, I can say this now because I'm not White House staff. I could not have said this two or three years ago. I think in America, when we have a problem with violence, um, with youth violence, video games uh, still get raised. Um, and I think it's a massive distraction. Um, I know the data on that topic very well on both sides. And you know, I have two little boys and I'm really serious about their health and well-being. So I'm not about to put my children at risk. I'm actually a complete tree-hugging, loving, pacifist, lefty, liberal progressive. So I don't like guns. Thank you. Thank you. I like peace, love. Um, so I'm not real keen on things that might actually inculcate people with violence, not my thing. But the truth is that the data doesn't bear out um, and it's such a weird stereotype. And here's the biggest problem of it. When we have a problem in the States with youth violence and guns, there are sort of known factors of what's contributing to that. Um, and it's things like poverty, instability in the home, um, mental health issues are the top three. There's a couple others. If you were looking at variables that matter, even if you want to take seriously some of the studies on games, which I would, I would love to have that conversation because it's worth some thought about, but even then their impact factor is so low. It's like 35 down on the, on the ranking. So what you find is that the American public, it's so much easier for a politician or a mom or a news anchor person to say video games are the problem because that's something that they are, there's a political will to legislate on. But in America, if, if poverty is the problem or mental health, access to better mental health care, there's not a lot of political will to solve it. So rather than talking about the things that actually cause stuff like gun violence, we do this deflection and we distract ourselves with video games when even if it were a cause, it's such a small item compared to like all of the other major factors there. So that's the thing I think is, um, is really problematic that American, you know, that, that it distracts us so terribly from dealing with the actual issues that we have. And they're serious issues, but they're issues that, you know, it's not just that politicians won't try to solve them, it's I don't think the American public has an appetite to solve it. So they don't bother, they talk about games, right? That's what happens. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was intrigued by your pie chart uh, with the uh, distribution of like absolutistic, relativistic and uh, claim-backed arguments. Uh, and I was wondering if you uh, know if, if that is something you need to gaming or if there are other like nerd worthy <laughs> subjects where this also occurs? Um, so I exclusively study games, but I really don't think that the patterns of, so I study game culture and behaviors. I study what happens to users in groups playing after you make the beautiful object that you're working on, right? But I don't think that those patterns actually are limited to game cultures. I think they're actually fandom. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of really interesting uh, critical work on, you know, whether it's Clay Shirky, sort of cognitive surplus, but on the historical circumstances that we're in that um, fandom culture has become a place in which we do a lot of um, uh, knowledge working of various sorts. So I don't think that it's unique to games at all. I will say that games to me are the most compelling medium because they are so thoroughly interactive. So that's sort of where I stay. But I don't think it's unique. Um, on, the, on the epistemological beliefs, you know, these days, you know, 10 years ago, you could say, I study games. People are like, oh, games, right? Now it's like, I study games. People are like, okay, but what games, right? Because 
Everyone is so much more literate on games. You don't have to like, you can actually say, I just study virtual worlds or I study, right? So um, I also think there's probably some uh, distinctions um, uh, within that category about um, fandom cultures of different types, right? So um, I do not always play games so I can do highbrow science. I tend to like to button mash and I like to play games, right? Which is a different kind of play pattern than theory crafting. But I think that theory crafting communities really uh, bubble up around almost any title or any other sort of fan medium. So the, the, there could be like theory crafting being done on the best sewing patterns and stuff, but absolutely uh, yes. Yeah, <laughs> but games may absolutely have a bigger yes. reach or something. Oh yeah. my God, I'm a knitter, and if you go on Ravelry, wow, <laughs> right? Like these are my people. I'm like, oh my God, it's just again, it's it's intense and serious, and it's amazing, right? Because I mean, my whole per the thing that perplexes me is that all of these things that we want our schools to be doing in the states to be fostering in the states are killing it. And all of that beautiful work, all of this rich intellectual enterprise that is really rewarding is happening in our play spaces these days. And you know, in my view, I think a lot of it's happening because of our assessment regimes um, and the way our schools are structured. I think we know how to teach children and I think we know what kind of environment to put them in, but we don't have the will to do it. Mm -hmm. Instead, we want to measure them. So you know, in a way, I know I'm on a rant and I'm sorry, but in a way I really see games as a Trojan horse for progressive pedagogy. Um, so that's why if I want them in classrooms, it's so that I can actually like shove a Trojan horse in there and be like, ha ha, we got him to play, look at that. Yeah. That's great, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> if we can make games that don't suck, right? <laughs> Time for other questions? Hmm? Hi. Um, Hi. Fantastic talk. I, Love it. I'm scientifically minded too. Um, I love neuroscience and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd love to talk to you afterward. But okay. my question is um, talking about l uh, literacy and uh, like in children reading and with interactivity in games and such. Uh, what place does programming have? Teaching programming in school? Because I see a lot of the correlations uh, between the problem solving there and uh, stealthily teaching math and math methodology and everything. Yeah. Uh, like how much would the introduction in the curriculum for uh, programming help similarly to the things you talk about? Yes, absolutely yes. And I will say that there is entire bodies of work right now trying to figure out, I mean obviously I would argue that the logic of code, that sort of computational literacy is the new public, almost a civil rights issue in the States. Like people are, well data is really a civil rights issue in the States, just no one wants to talk about it. Um, but on the issue of code, I would say that computational literacy is like one of the quintessential, I would argue, um, new literacies that are an absolute must. And so games are really caught up in that because, um, well, because uh, they're natural allies. It's not just that they're computational objects, but they're computational objects you can open the hood on and start to get a feel for how they, they're made. So there are lots of, um, lots of research efforts and development efforts being put into how do you make games like GameStar Mechanic or Scratch or Logo or um, how do you start forming like you know, women's maker spaces that are quilting spaces as ways to start to build up those competencies and those interests early on because a lot of that, um, the numbers about computer science are really frightening, right? Uh, in the States, we have a real problem. I have to say, um, as someone who does games on like a university campus, we're considered a tier one research university, so ooh la la. Um, but um, anyone else on my campus here? Okay. None of the computer scientists will even have anything to do with this. Like, they're just sort of like, I'm sorry, games, that will go away, right? And you're like, mm, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, but all of their students want to come over and intern in our center because all of their students want to work on actual projects, right? So there's this weird thing I'm trying to point to, which is that there's this deep resonance between games and code, and there's this affinity between those activities, right? But institutions don't always like to align that way. So we'll see. Thank you. 
Hey, this is actually kind of a follow-up to the last question. Um, so I, uh, I, I've been in the games industry for about 12 years as a, as a computer scientist. Well, I'm a programmer. But um, when I was in high school, we actually did have a programming class, but it was in, in uh, you know, pretty like late. Uh, it was only offered in like 10th and 11th grade or something. It was advanced placement. So right. already, it kind of um, the amount of people who would even sign up for that class it was a very specialized kind of group of people. So I kind of wonder, um, or my personal feeling about how we can solve a lot of the gender gap in computer science in general is to have computer science uh, compulsory. Uh, from very, yeah. very early on. And the reason why I think this will work is because it will allow women to have their own way of relating to computer science and science in general um, at a very early age. Yeah. Uh, but I, my, my question is like, have there, you know, how does the White House feel about this? Or like, how possible is, is this? And do you do any games that are kind of like, you know, teaching, teaching kids to program and things like that? There are an amazing array of titles that are about teaching kids to program. Um, and a lot of them are using various visual metaphor interfaces as a mezzanine way to get kids from design over into code. So there's a lot of incredible efforts there. And I think it has huge legs. Am I mistaken that didn't England make computer science just recently in the last maybe two years? I think that England did exactly what you're saying which I think is absolutely a wonderful solution, right? Um, so we'll see if we ever catch up to that. I, I mean, I don't know uh, with the states about, I, yeah, I don't know. I really hope. I mean, if you, have any, if you have any strings you can pull in the White House, that would be amazing. <laughs> so the way that I got out of working for the White House is sort of finding my own replacement, <laughs> right? They stop calling you when you say, here's the person that you can call now, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the gentleman, he was from THQ, his name is Mark Delora. Does anyone know who Mark yes, Delora is? Yes, I actually know him personally. He's yes. wonderful. And he worked on this issue of code during his entire year there. So I can point you to some of the efforts that he made, but he, he was terrific about, this was a real push issue for him. So I would love to say that I made traction on it. I didn't, but he did. Um, I also just wanted to thank you for your work. I mean, it's pretty incredible what you presented today. Um, and also, Mark Delure, he they, they did a game jam at the White House. Yes. And yeah. like, you know, you, <laughs> you found your own replacement. I just wanted to thank you for <laughs> the fact that that even existed. You're I welcome. know it wasn't maybe directly your involvement, but that's You're welcome. awesome. Yeah. Um, I have to say that um, a colleague of mine once asked me, well, what do you think was like, what did you accomplish? Or, you know, because you were like, I don't know what I got done, right? Um, and he had asked, like, well, what do you think is your biggest accomplishment in the White House? And I was like, you know, honestly, this is a little bit humbling to admit, but just actually having someone with a title of games. When I first came in, they were like, well, do you want to be interactive media? And I was like, nope. And they're like, you want to be digital media? I'm like, nope. I want to be games, video games, straight up unadulterated games. And part of the reason was because, you know, in a way, it adds credibility and leverage for, um, you know, it's harder to dismiss when they have a strategic person whose title explicitly is games there. So I took some crap for that, but I was like, you know what? I mean, in some ways, I think the biggest accomplishment was the fact that we had an administration that understood enough about what it meant to change behaviors collectively, not in a top-down legislative, you know, big P policy way, but to think about how do you build systems that people can opt into that can be really transformative in positive ways without having to be so onerous and um, about rules in a way that are not game rules, right? So that to me was the biggest innovation uh, and continues to be. I would love to say I did something bigger than that, but I think probably them just hiring me was probably the only. I showed up. I did that. Hi, Karen. Hi. I oh. stayed out too late last night while you went to bed. <laughs> well, it didn't, just let me know. Your, didn't affect your talk, though, did it? <laughs> Um, we had this conversation last night of, you know, I should do my slides. I should do my slides, but this conversation is so good. I think I should stay for it. Um, I wanted to thank you. That was such an enlightening and educational <laughs> talk. Because as you know, I come from a different background. I'm a digital artist, so I'm a bit late to this party because I have gamification. Oh, I have gamification in my work. But yeah. what you do, like your whole world, is something I was completely not aware of. And yeah. 
how you've um, presented the information, which is very complex and very dense in a way which is really accessible for myself and everybody oh, here, good. is really, really interesting. Um, so thank you. So my question is, I know your objective is to make educational games that don't suck in the future, but if you were looking to make another, a slightly different premise, exceptional educational games, mm. say in about five years or so, a little bit further down the future, what would that look like? I don't know what it would look like, but I can tell you what its metaphoric sort of sister would be. And it would be something like Montessori's Pink Tower, right? Anyone familiar with the Pink Tower? Right, cubes that go from, they, there are 10 cubes that stack. They get incrementally smaller and smaller. They actually display the relationship, a binomial relationship, and a child starts by simply playing with them on the ground, and then from that sorts them, and then from that you can't help, but when you touch them, you want to stack them, right? And what you end up creating in a child is this deep understanding of the relationship from one to 10 in a very sort of um, embodied sort of, and they're beautiful, they're heavy, <laughs> and they have really sharp corners, and they're wood, and they're painted like uh, like Pepto-Bismol pink. Do you have that pink in Sweden? Um, so, and the reason I'm detailing this is that um, that to me is the essence of design. Something that is um, uh, an object to think with. You know, we were talking earlier about art versus sort of pedantic kind of stuff in games. I'm really interested in um, games that, um, how do I put this? Games that uh, take a concept and illuminate that concept. And sometimes by that I mean make available a practice that would otherwise not be available. I'll give you an example from my own uh, background. So <clears throat> I, was, um, I did three degrees at once when I was an undergraduate in the States, and one of them was mathematics. I also did uh, literature, creative writing, and I did religious studies, people, gods, women's studies, women or gods, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, and in the mathematics department, I was the only female in that department. Um, and my favorite thing was Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. And the reason I loved it was that it's a bit like the sensation of trying to develop a proof is a bit like rock climbing. Does anyone else do geometry in here? Right, so you like kind of go down a path and then you sort of get stuck and you're like, oh crap, and you have to sort of walk backward a bit to get different handles. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this deep aesthetic pleasure of doing that kind of work. Um, I would like a game that took something like that, like that deep pleasure, that deep aesthetic of what is so pleasing about doing a Euclidean or non-Euclidean, like a geometric proof, and I would like to make that available to children and to adults. So that to me would be like the metaphor of the kind of game I'm after. I think we have examples of things that are partially there. I would hope on a good day that some of the games we're making might be partially there, but I don't think we've actually had any big wins in that space at all yet. Thank you, Garen. Is that all? Well, in Masson. Okay. Hello again. Hi. Hi. Um, there's one thing that I'm finding curious about uh, a lot of talk about uh, games is that when we talk about games, we most often talk about digital games. Uh, yes. But Games has been around for thousands of years in terms mm -hmm. of board games or, or even before that in play. Uh, why does it feel like there's a preceded the disparity between or an incongruity of sorts between play and uh, <coughs> digital games? That is a great question. I mean, they are all in this long history and tradition of games, whether they're board games, card games, social games, recess games, right? Um, I don't know, although I will say that the, the romance of digital games from a Games for Impact perspective is that they're treated as though they're scalable. Now, we could argue whether or not this is actually the right metric, but I can tell you it's because they're seen as scalable, uh, meaning it, scalable, um, and also because um, the data exhaust you can get out of them is um, so rich for analysis, right? I don't know that it's any other obsession beyond that, but it is interesting because um, I will say, I don't know any designers that don't also play board games and play like social games and live action role playing, but I'm not supposed to say that, now I'm supposed to say interactive theater, is that right? 
<laughs> I don't LARP, everybody. I do interactive theater, okay? Um, I don't know. Just learned that the other day. Um, so I don't know any game designer in digital media that isn't also playing these other forms, but for some reason, digital media has a lot of traction, and they're monetizable in a way that probably is the most persuasive one. I'll play board Thank games you. with you, totally. Okay. Let's do it. Thank you for being so patient. It's good to be here.